typographer having introduced me in this uh, or having included me in his instruction course and my apologies that I had to prepone my talk because of the second commitment. This is about the surgical management of detachments of retina with coloboma of choroid. For some reason in India we seem to see, see this condition pretty commonly compared to the western literature where they see it very occasionally. And go to go straight to the management of retinal detachments we need to understand the anatomy of the coloboma and what causes the detachment related to the coloboma. Again, for this, I would refer you to the article by Dr. Schubert, wherein he has described beautifully that the retina, as it goes towards the coloboma, splits actually into two layers. The inner layer continues as the intracalary membrane, which is a fibrotic membrane that covers the coloboma, while the outer layer turns backwards and then merges with the retinal pigment epithelium. And it is this junction which has been called as the area of the least resistance. And this is the area which has to communicate with the sub-ICM space for it to cause a retinal detachment clinically. You can see on the OCT as well that this is the retina, normal thickness, and the inner layers are continuing as the uh, fibrotic intracalary membrane beyond the coloboma margin. But the outer layers are actually turning back and joining the retinal pigment epithelium. And histopathologically, sometimes you can actually see a double layer of photoreceptors at this point because there's one layer here another layer which has turned back. And we also have described some breaks in the intracalary membrane, not that they are important from the management point of view, but it gives you a perspective how difficult it is to identify these breaks against the backdrop of a lack of retinal pigment epithelium, but it also gives you an understanding that you need a break in the intracalary membrane as well for a clinical retinal detachment to take place, in addition to the break at the area of least resistance. So we found that there can be breaks right here in the middle of the intracalary membrane within the coloboma. It can be multiple breaks, or as in this case, there are three breaks. Or you can find a break right at the edge of the coloboma where only one edge of the intracalary membrane break is actually lifted. That is this edge. While the second edge is actually merging with the coloboma floor. Or it can be at the area of the macular, macula, which is involved in the coloboma. You know this is macula because it's surrounded by the area of the uh, lowest pigmentation of macular lutea. So the variables in an eye with coloboma are, one is the peripheral retinal break, which may be there, may not be there, but you need a break in the intracalary membrane and a break in the area of least resistance for the coloboma itself to be responsible for the retinal detachment. So if you have only peripheral break, it's as good as any other eye without coloboma, and RD involves the normal retina, doesn't encroach within the colobomatous area, and there's no ICM detachment and the management is as a routine. But before we manage it as a routine, we must be sure that there is really no intracalary membrane detachment. A small area of detachment at the margin can be easily missed in a microphthalmic eye with nystagmus. So if there is only ICM break, which is the other end of the spectrum, then you get only an ICM detachment, like in this case. The ICM detachment doesn't spill over to the normal retina because there's no communication between the sub-ICM space and the sub space at the junction, the junction of the least resistance. So in these cases, a prophylactic laser along the coloboma margin will probably be useful to prevent this from spilling into the uh, subretinal space later on. But when you have a break at the locus manaris resistantiae with ICM break, with or without a peripheral break, this is exactly what leads to a clinical detachment of retina with which the patient comes to you. Then the retina is detached, there's also an ICM detachment, and they both are communicating with each other. And that communication of subretinal space and sub-ICM space is through a break at the locus minoris resistance. But the break in the ICM is not easily demonstrable, and the break at the area of least resistance is never demonstrable clinically, except by OCT. The other variables are the size of the eyeball could be very small, the lens can be opaque partly or completely. There's coloboma of the iris and the disc could be involved in coloboma to a variable degree. And macula also could be involved in the coloboma. And there could be also PVR as well. In addition, you find that the ICM itself could be taut and could be a cause for the retina being lifted up at the margin of the coloboma. The detachment at the coloboma margin could also be chronic because very often the PVTS did not detach and the traction is what leads to the repeated occurrences of RPA disturbance and uh, demarcation lines. 
a more rapid spread occurs once there is some amount of liquid which is available for the retina to detach. You can identify the site of communication between the subretinal space and the sub ICM space by OCT. As you can see in this section, which is at this point, you can see the communication. But in the same eye, uh, another section at this point, which is just beyond, you don't see the communication at all. This is again showing the sub ICM space communicating with the subretinal space. So eyes with only peripheral retinal detachment and no ICM detachment, you manage routinely, ignoring the coloboma. While when you are up to do a vitrectomy, you must understand that the location of sclerotomies would vary depending upon the degree of microphthalmia. You may, have to, you may have to sacrifice the lens in a few cases, even if the lens is clear because of the eyeball being so small, the lens being correspondingly large. Questionable role of encephalage, especially in an eye with a large coloboma extending almost through about to have four o'clock hours. What is encephalage doing? Really nothing because the inferior part doesn't need any support. There's no retina there. And the part of the retina which needs support is all superiorly located. A vitrectomy with the debulking of the vitreous base is, for, is the same as for any other vitrectomy approach for a retinal detachment. You induce PVD and this could be traumatic to the area of least resistance and hence you can actually induce more communications between subretinal space and the sub space than what they were to start with. And hence, we try to treat the entire coloboma on the table and not restrict the treatment to the area of what was originally seen as a communication between the two spaces. So if, there's, if you do fluid gas exchange with removal of the vitreous fluid alone from the optic disc or colobomatous floor, you find different behaviors in the, the three situations. If you have only peripheral break, the detachment balloons around the coloboma, but there's no communication between subretinal space and the vitreous cavity. There's no flattening of retina taking place and no spread into the ICM area. But if you have a peripheral break and a break in the area of least resistance, the fluid is pushed to the posterior pole, but is also pushed into the coloboma because there's a communication at subretinal space and sub ICM space level. But again, it doesn't flatten. But when you have a break at all the three points, you find the retina flattens automatically without any effort because the fluid is able to be pushed from subretinal space into sub ICM space and into the vitreous cavity. Once you flatten the retina, you treat the coloboma margin with two to three rows. I prefer a diode laser because it doesn't have a risk of burning the nerve fiber layer accidentally, especially in those eyes where the disc is involved in the coloboma. And it's important to treat up to the aura serrata. But sometimes the macula may be just outside the coloboma margin. So if you go across that coloboma margin, you run a risk of destroying the macula. Then you'd probably skirt the macula, means leave about 100, 200 microns away on either side of the macula untreated, taking a risk that if you remove the oil also, the retina may remain attached. Silicon oil is preferred in most cases because of the large area of the coloboma margin that needs to be tamponaded. But gas may be okay in ice where there's a localized detachment in one quadrant and there's a localized ICM detachment and there was easy PVD induction. Over a period of time, we have accumulated enough experience to tell that this approach is very successful in reattaching the retina, especially in those eyes which did not come to you with PVR and a contracted retina. You can have, this is the initial series which showed about 81% success with 70% having functional vision. And later on, we accumulated a few more K cases between 98 and 2006, which showed almost a 95% success because we also improve our techniques. We're better at doing what we are doing all along and a large number of people have got good navigational vision. So in conclusion, colobomas are a special situation with a high incidence of detachment of retina in the lifetime of the individual the pattern of breaks is unconventional and one need to understand the pathogenesis of the detachment related to the coloboma itself. Parsplenic vitrectomy with silicon oil gives us a very good success rate with satisfying surgical and visual success. Thank you for your attention.